Hey there, my brothers and my sisters, Paul here, coming to you from FEMA region number four. The picture that you're uh, looking at right about now, well, I took that. I took it this past April the 21st. It was in a very beautiful little park called Aspen Grove in Franklin, Tennessee. It was Resurrection Day. And the weather was absolutely perfect for a walk in a woods peppered with little bridges that crossed over the most picturesque of babbling brooks and streams. <laughs> it was one of the more, oh, settled days that I've experienced since leaving Maryland in late January. I thought this picture a perfect intro and thumbnail for this year video. After completing my last video, the first edition of what I've taken to call the Paul Report, I immediately began preparing for a second edition. For I'm certain that you are all certain <laughs> that at this time there is hardly a shortage of news stories we could cover. And it's been that way for quite a while. A little over a month ago, I posted a video in which I decried the fact that there was so much to report and I had no idea whether I'd get to all of it. But as I said, I, I planned, <laughs> oh, that's rich, planned to do another poll report. But alas, Abba put a stop to that by bringing to my mind and my heart several comments that were made on this video by a dear sister. Let me show you. It were these comments here, <laughs> but I'd like to have you view them with a more fitting background as they truly moved me and inspired me to forsake my plans <laughs> and go with our almighty fathers, as I'm sure it was he that moved this dear sister to comment as such. Here is what she wrote. Paul, good to see you doing videos again. Maybe you could do more scriptures like Laban. Oh, thank you and praying for you. And then the other comment was this. I would like you to do more comforting videos with the word of God and talk about Jesus and what he has done for us. Oh, my dear sister, thank you. Thank you. How in the world... Could I put together a bunch of headlines after such a request as this? Oh my gosh, this has touched my heart and blessed me to no end. Oh my. What greater privilege and honor could I be given by the Almighty of hosts than for him to choose me to comfort his children? What greater thing could possibly happen to me and, and or anyone else who professes faith in the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, than, than to have one of his little ones, one of his children, royal blood, that's right, royal blood, ask them to comfort them with the word of God. There is no greater privilege than that. There is no greater honor than that. There is no greater blessing. And you see, being within the body of Christ as well, well, in comforting others within it, I do what? I comfort myself. And let me say that while we must be aware of what's going on around us, while we must be as wise as serpents, a litany of headlines and quote-unquote breaking news, well, that will never comfort in the true regard Knowing the latest wars and rumors of wars will, will not bring on the peace that surpasses all understanding, at least not in the way that the Apostle Paul described in his doctrinal treatise slash letter to the, to the body of Christ in Philippi. In this letter, he tells us what to think about. <laughs> Read this letter. In fact, Read Romans through Philemon like never before. He, the preeminent post-cross preacher, our, our primary pastor, the Apostle Paul, exhorted us time and time again in his doctrinal instructions to do this. If ye then be risen with Christ, 
Seek those things which have been reported on Fox News. No, that's not what it says. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That is a command. That is not advice. That is not a suggestion. And Jesus himself gave the Apostle Paul the authority to make this command. Friends, my dear brother Scott Clark has challenged me to dive deep into the writings of the Apostle Paul. And the more I do, the more I realize that as part of the body of Christ, we the body, Jesus the head, the more we come to know that with all confidence, then all of this world's gossip and its idiotic itinerary of breaking news and rehashing of headlines becomes literally irrelevant because we as the body of Jesus Christ are simply above it all. And there, therein lies the peace that surpasses all understanding because we as the body are what? We are careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, making our requests known to God. And in doing this, what happens? The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, who is the head of us, his body. Now I ask you, do you see anything in these two verses about watching after the signs of the times? Jesus commanded that of his sheep, not his own body. We are the body of Jesus, not sheep. Is Jesus a sheep? No. Then as his body, we are not either. The command to watch after the signs of the times was given to his sheep, not his own body. What sense could that even make? Nowhere, nowhere within the writings of the Apostle Paul are we referred to as sheep. We are his body. Now I am sure that at least one out there would take me to task on this because of Romans 8 verse 36 in which Paul writes, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Please realize, brothers and sisters, that this is a generalization with regard to how we die unto self, not in the way that Scripture deals with the difference between sheep and goats. Brothers and sisters, and and please do not be offended by this overtly obvious observation. We are simply not to dwell on the things of the world, and that includes the news of the world. It has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on our true lives. It only leads to stress because, <laughs> well, because we begin to commiserate over the unsaved. And it is here that we must recall the universally doctrinal command given to us directly from our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. One of our adversary's greatest tactics, one of the great weapons in his arsenal is to bring us down by getting us to dwell on the unsaved. It is a stumbling block that must be avoided. If that peace that passes all understanding is to be maintained, we have nothing whatsoever to do with the news of the world. Here is now my challenge. Go into the writings of the Apostle Paul and highlight all the times that he goes into the subject of wars and rumors of wars. Circle all the instances in which Paul mentions earthquakes and famines and plagues. Make note of all the warnings he gives about the seas and the waves roaring 
And if anyone knows about that, it's Paul, because <laughs> he was shipwrecked three times. Friends, you see exactly what I'm getting at. The number of times that Paul warns us of these things, well, he doesn't. Why do you think that is? Oh, my brothers and my sisters, it is so, so simple. Does Jesus follow the news of the world? Or is he above the news of the world? The answer is obvious. And so if the head, Jesus, is above it, his body is too. And we are his body. Spiritually, we are completely immune to the, to the effects of the news of the world. We are above it. Those who are affected by the news of the world are those who seem to long not for our blessed hope, which is our being caught up to meet our Lord in the air, but those who long for being caught up in the intrigue of the Antichrist. In other words, those who are not of the body of the actual Christ. What happens, my brothers and sisters, to those who are left here to experience Daniel's 70th week? Those who claim Christ or somehow come to believe in Christ during this time, what happens to them? Well, they get their heads chopped off. How, how in the world can the body of Christ get its head chopped off? <laughs> Here, here is absolute unequivocal proof that we, the body of Christ, who is our head, can't possibly be on earth during Daniel's 70th week. How, I ask you once again, can the body of Christ get its head chopped off when our head is Christ? Stew on that for a while. What is the result of decapitation, people? It is the what? It is the separation of the body from its what? Its head! Brothers and sisters, here is another proof of our absence from the darkest and most horrific period in human history. Who is our head? Jesus. Does he love us? Of course he does. And what are we told about his love by the Holy Spirit through the words of our primary pastor, the Apostle Paul, who shall, what? Separate. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Again, what is a decapitation? It is a separation, which according to the word of our almighty God is an impossibility with regard to the relationship between Jesus and his very own body. And look at the first situation that the Apostle Paul uses in this verse. Tribulation. What the worldly church calls Daniel's 70th week. Now, granted, Paul does not capitalize the T here, and he is most likely not referring directly to Daniel's 70th week, but come on, the Holy Spirit knows what he is doing when he gave these words to Paul. And note, the last thing that Paul mentions in this verse, the what? The sword. Now, you may be saying, oh, Paul, how can such a mass execution be carried out with mere swords. Well, I say this. If John the Revelator had been given a vision of something akin to a guillotine, he would have at least tried to describe it. And granted, guillotines are a much more viable solution. But even so, what else is a guillotine but a mechanized what? A mechanized sword. And so in conclusion to the crux of this bite of this biscuit, <laughs> I reiterate, since we are given by the Holy Spirit the divine promise that nothing, that is nothing, no thing, can separate us from Christ, since we are given that promise by the Word of God, it is not possible for Christ's body to be present during what the worldly quote-unquote church calls the tribulation. More accurately and scripturally, 
Daniel's 70th week, a time during which believers' bodies are separated from their heads. And so, my brothers and my sisters, this is proof positive that the rapture will, will, will occur prior to this period of human history. Comfort one another with these words. Amen and Maranatha. Now, before I answer the question, what did everything we just talked about have to do with the psalm of the moment, allow me to say that I do not think it is wrong or a waste of time to be interested in the news. <laughs> I I have been a news junkie from the womb. I love history and I love politics. I mean, come on. There is a very, very thin line between show business and politics. <laughs> All I wanted to get across is that because we are the body of Christ, none of it has any bearing on the thing that we all want way, way more than this life. And that is our blessed hope, the rapture. That's all I'm saying. We, the body of Christ, are leaps and bounds ahead of this rat race, the rat race of this world, because we are running a different race. And that, of course, is the one that our primary pastor, the Apostle Paul, told us about in the letters that he wrote to who? To us. So, I hope I did not give you the impression that it's wrong to follow the news. My goal is for us all to know that it has no bearing at all on what we long for the most. The pre-Daniel 70th week catching away of us, the body of Jesus Christ, King of everything. Let me say also, for those who may be thinking about my citation of Christ's words in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, this is not a harsh word. What Jesus is saying is simply what he taught Paul, what we read only moments ago. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That's exactly what Jesus was telling that man. And what else did Jesus say? No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. From there, go back to Paul, who was personally taught by Christ, as we all know, and to another verse that we showed. Be careful for nothing. This includes the plight of the unsaved, but it doesn't mean not to care about them. If we constantly commiserate over the unsaved, what does it say about our trust in our Abba Father? Who better knows that they're unsaved? Who better knows that they're kicking against the goads? The very words that Jesus said to Paul when he struck that persecutor of believers blind on the road to that place that is swiftly becoming, if it hasn't already become, a ruinous heap. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, read Isaiah 17. And now that answer. <laughs> the answer to the question, what did all that we have just delved into have to do with a psalm of the moment? Well, I have no clue. It was where Abba led me. I, the human being, had every intention of going straight to the psalm because the dear sister who had asked to be comforted asked, that it be through a psalm. As I say, I was going to go straight to the psalm, and believe you me, I, I knew exactly which psalm I wanted to go into, but Abba led me down the road. We just went down together. Now I just said that I have no clue why Abba led us down the road we've just been on, but I'm, uh, I'm getting an idea. I'm getting an idea. So how about we just... Get on with it. Ba do do do. Ooh. 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 
keep in mind, my brothers and my sisters, that for our dear sister, the one that touched my heart with her comments, not to say that every comment I receive does not reach into my crazy Polish emotions, whatever that means, for that dear sister, the crux of this biscuit is comfort. Come on! Thus far in the video, outside of Matthew 8 and 22, all of the verses we've read have been from the pen of the Apostle Paul, our primary pastor, whom Jesus Christ, our God, our Creator, our Savior, our King, and our what? Our Head, personally gave the tenets of our doctrine to. And it hit me. The dear sister wants comfort, true comfort, comfort, like peace, that will pass all understanding. So where else is there to go? Where, as the body of Jesus Christ, not the sheep, the body, where, as the body of Jesus Christ, are we to go to find the most perfect and relevant writings with regard to comfort? That's right. But Paul, uh, referring to myself right now, <laughs> but Paul, we always go to the Psalms for comfort, do we not? To this I say, yes, yes, and so we should. We should go there too. Recall that it was pointed out that the Apostle Paul in his writings says nothing, nothing, no thing about our need to keep watch over what is going on within the system of the Earth Dwellers, a.k.a. the signs of the times, the news, or the world. However, he does, not once, but twice, say this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, if that doesn't comfort you, if that doesn't comfort you, then I, I am a Cyprian butcher on Taltz. Don't even ask. Oh, 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 my goodness. Do you, do, you, do you realize the gravity of what is in these two verses here, my friends? Now, you may be thinking, uh, come on now, the Apostle Paul couldn't possibly have meant for us to go back to those old Testament psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They were not written for ones such as us, partakers in the age of grace. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, if that be the case, then come on and show me where to find in our scriptures these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. I dare anyone to tell me that the Apostle Paul and the early church were given some sort of new batch of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that the Holy Spirit decided to keep secret from us, who is the body of Christ, just as much as they were. You know full well, my brothers and sisters, that there is only one batch of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that has been given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for our edification, exhortation, and, oh yes, comfort. And that is to be found in only one place in your old King Jim. Between Job and Proverbs. Let me say again, my brothers and my sisters, the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that our primary pastor, the Apostle Paul, is telling us to make melody in our hearts unto the Lord with are the ones that the Lord gave in that amazing and divinely inspired book between Job and Proverbs. If there had been some sort of new batch of such, our Abba would have never 
never withheld them from us. The Apostle Paul went to the Psalms of David himself, as is evidenced here. From his letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Do you think that perhaps the Apostle Paul is quoting David here because he realizes that David is not preaching a works doctrine? Do you think that perhaps the Apostle Paul realizes that David is a type of Christ? Do you think that the Apostle Paul had enough sense to tell the difference between which of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs were profitable for the body of Christ and which were spoken directly to national Israel? I do. <laughs> I believe that the Apostle Paul had enough sense to discern that. I also believe that the Apostle Paul felt strongly that psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are in no way, shape, or form to be taken as strictly a form of what the literal definition of such suggests. What are you getting at here, a Polish Paul? Uh, as I say to distinguish myself from... Apostle Paul, what I'm getting at is this. Let's go back to our previous verses. Let us again read Colossians 3 and 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, entertaining and distracting one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. No, no, that is not, certainly not what it says. What it says is this teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms. We have perfect confirmation that the Apostle Paul used the Psalms to edify, exhort, and the comfort. Well, the comfort is built right into Ephesians 5.19, making melody in your hearts to the Lord with what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So yes, oh yes, the Apostle Paul intended for us to teach, admonish, and comfort each other with the greatest songbook and hymnal ever written and written by the Holy Spirit himself. And if there were another batch aside from the ones we already have in our scriptures, Abba would have seen fit to give them to us. There is no doubt about it. And before anyone tries to argue that Paul's use of Psalms was perhaps to somehow arouse the Jews or whatever, the letter in which Paul invokes the Psalms the most is in his first to the Corinthians. Quite a hearty bunch of Hebrews in that bunch, eh? <laughs> he invokes the Psalms many times in 1 Corinthians. And all sarcasm aside, to the most carnal of Jews? No, Gentiles. If there are any of Paul's writings directed to carnal Gentiles, it is the ones to the Corinthians. And it is also no coincidence that the verse from Romans 8 that I cited earlier about sheep comes from Paul, quoting what? Psalm number 44 of Masco. Just like Psalm 32, which Paul cited in Romans chapter 4, is a mescal. You know, I got curious and decided to search a bit about this term mescal. And I found this wonderful little piece. Read along with me. Mescal is a Hebrew word which appears only in the Old Testament and most often in the Psalms. Perhaps Daniel is the only other place where the sense of this word is found in the Old Testament. However, its basic meaning may be found in the New Testament in Colossians 3.16. Oh yeah. Maskel as a verb means to give instruction or to make wise. As a noun, it is masculine and means one or those who instruct or possibly. 
In Psalm 32, which is a masculine psalm, we read in verses 8 and 9, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Keep that in your back pocket. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. It is one of several psalms written for specific instruction, but sung as a psalm. In a coming day, after the church is called home to be with the Lord Jesus at the rapture, the masculine psalms will have particular meaning to the godly remnant of Israel, and they will understand their meanings and instructions during that terrible time of awful tribulation. The masculine psalms will specially guide them. In Daniel 12, 3, we also read, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This prophecy also refers to the time of tribulation and to the remnant who will be instructed by the maskalim. In the New Testament context, it is not the sense of preparing to live through the tribulation, but rather the manner and spirit in which Christians should seek to help, exhort, and instruct one another. Thus, we read in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Ow. And a fritzy pop for that nice little piece right there. Brothers and sisters, it is quite evident that our Abba Father intended for these particular psalms which have been designated as mascals to serve both true national Israel, a.k.a. the remnant, and the body of Christ. Or else our primary pastor, the Apostle Paul, would not be telling us, the body of Christ, to teach and admonish <laughs> and comfort one another with them. I also discovered this interesting and confirming quote from John Wesley with regard to the definition of the term maskil. In his notes on, that's right, you got it, Psalm 32, he writes, maskil, or an instructor. The psalm, he is speaking of Psalm 32, the psalm is fitly so called because it was composed for information in that most important, what? What? What's that word there? In that most important doctrine, in that most important doctrine, the way to true blessedness. Man, oh man, if Fritzy hadn't run out to get gravy for dinner tonight, I'd be calling for another pop. Oh, <laughs> permit me yet again, my dear, dear friends, to say that I cannot in any stretch of my imagination believe that our Abba would give the Apostle Paul a new batch of psalms and then instruct him not to record them. It would have been absolutely antithetical to everything our God had instructed Paul to put forth in his doctrine, which is to edify, exhort, and comfort or as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.19, to make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And now, <laughs> let us do just that. Let us make melody in our hearts to the Lord and read together our psalm of the moment. Psalm 32, a psalm of David, a masco. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. 
I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And that is the word of God. Amen. And Maranatha. Oh, my brothers and sisters, did you see? Did you feel? <laughs> did you feel the Apostle Paul actually in this psalm? I know I did. Brothers and sisters, to me there can be no doubt that the Apostle Paul invoked Psalm 32 not only because it is dripping with sound doctrine. It also spoke directly to his heart. Who wrote this psalm, this masco? My friends, David. David the murderer. What did David write in his famous confessional to God? In his Psalm 51, does he lament that he has sinned against Bathsheba or against Uriah the Hittite or against his army or against his country? No. He says this, against thee, thee only, have I sinned. And we know who that thee is, do we not? <laughs> look now, look now here. The book of Acts, chapter 9, a man called Saul, and not unlike his ancient king, a murderer is on his way to murder some more, but he is stricken down and blinded by Jesus Christ, who says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou my sheep? Ha <laughs> ha that's not what it says, does it? Oh no, Jesus said, why persecutest thou me? Paul knew right then and there what he had done, that he had sinned against no one but God himself. It was as if Jesus had looked down upon Saul and said, You are the man. Look at verses 4 and 5. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And another Selah, which of course means <laughs> stew on that a while. Do you think it possible that Saul, not yet having become Paul, experienced this as he sat in the home of one named, of all names, Judas, not knowing that one named Ananias was about to come to him by the instruction of the one who struck him? Do you think that prior to the realization that he had actually been forgiven, that Paul felt like a dried up piece of dirt, that his bones ached as one dehydrated of anything good? I do. Jesus Christ, the king of the universe, has just told this man, you are personally responsible for persecuting me. 
Do you think that a person might feel a bit heavy after being told such a thing? I do. And look at verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Has anybody out there tried to fight sin's sickening accusation, but you simply couldn't keep it in and you, you roared with guilt? And, and that word roared can also be translated as groaned. I've been there. I've been there countless times, and if I, who have never murdered a soul, can experience this type of roaring slash groaning, what do you think one who has had the very finger of God pointed at him for murder would feel like? I see an amazing similarity between the situations of David and Saul, but understand that I am in no wise saying that this psalm was some sort of foreshadow of the coming of Paul or the existence of Paul. I'm just saying that Paul could certainly relate to what David was writing here. I mean, take a look at verse 4 again. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Man, oh man, I see an almost literal similarity between what David wrote here and what Paul experienced after the Damascus Road event. For what do we read in Acts 9? And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now I think it's pretty safe to say that after three days without water, his moisture pretty much felt as if it had turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Now let us look at verse 8. It is verse 8 of our psalm of the moment that I feel hearkens most to the journey of our apostle. Look at the encounter between Jesus and Ananias in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 10 through 16. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Did this happen in Paul's life? Did the psalmist write, Men will instruct thee. Men will show you what to do. Of course not. David wrote that God himself would be the teacher. And we learn from Paul himself that that was the case. We read that in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. And take note of what Jesus told Ananias about what Paul was doing. Acts 9.11 says, And the Lord said unto him, that is Ananias, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. He was praying. That is what Saul was doing. And now verses 5, 6, and 7 of our psalm of the moment. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. You think he was confessing along with his praying? I do. I think he was. And then perhaps he, he remembered. He remembered his vision that he had of this man coming to heal him. Verse 6, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. 
Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Do you think, perhaps, that Saul of Tarsus was coming to the realization that he had been forgiven by Jesus? Oh, yes. Why would he have a vision of his being healed? Why would Jesus tell him, get up and go to this place and I'll tell you what to do? I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. Ha <laughs> ha Now, once again, let me point out that I am not in any way, shape, or form saying that this is some kind of prophecy of Paul. Oh, no, no. I am just comparing Paul's experience to what David wrote in this psalm. That's the crux of this biscuit. Now, let us look at the second sentence of verse 8. This is the one that struck home with me big time. I will guide thee with mine eye. In all honesty, my brothers and sisters, when I read this in preparation for this video, the Father immediately placed it upon my heart that that was not how to read that sentence. That is the way I just read it. It is to be read like this. I will guide thee with mine eye. It is as if it is indicating, forget your eyes, mine will be yours. The eyes of God will be yours. Does this ring a bell anywhere in your soul? It surely did mine. For what could be more specific to Paul than the fact that he had been struck blind by God? And so, as his eyes had been struck by God, God in order to serve his purpose, his divine will, will give Paul his eyes. Men had gouged out the eyes of Samson and Zedekiah, but Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he has the distinction of being the only person in all of history to be struck blind by the God of all things. Quite a distinction. Is it not? <laughs> I truly believe that since Paul invoked the words of David almost verbatim here, I speak of verses 1 and 2, that he knew the entire psalm very well. And if he did, how convicted, encouraged, and amazed he must have been when he, after his conversion, read the words, I will guide thee with mine eye. Another aspect of this to take note of is this. In the way that the Psalms are recorded in the Old King Jim, the word eyes, plural, occurs 43 times. The word eye, singular, as it appears in Psalm 32 verse 8, occurs 54 times. However, only once is it apparent that God himself is putting his eyes in the place of man's. And that one time is in Psalm 32, verse 8. In all other instances, when God's eyes are mentioned, it indicates that they are watching over man. Please let me point out something again that I am not saying. I am not saying that God gave Paul uh, supernatural eyes and new eyes. No, no. <laughs> He was healed, and they remained eyes of flesh. We will not have incorruptible, non-flesh eyes until we meet our Lord in the air. It is obvious what is being put forth here. God is simply saying this. My eye, the eye of my spirit, will be yours. It shall remain flesh but indwelled with my spirit. That is what is being said. Again, I believe that the Apostle Paul knew this psalm inside and out and loved it. He loved it because it told him this. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man under whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. No wonder that Paul wanted to quote David here, because basically... What verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 32 is saying is this, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Come on! 
How, how, how could Paul possibly resist such words as these found in the initial verses of our psalm of the moment? <laughs> oh. And now for the final three verses of our psalm, 9 through 11. Be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding. <laughs> Interesting how the, the word I and horse kind of, you know, uh, well, you see what I'm getting at. You, you might think that's a stretch, but hey, <laughs> so what? There are no coincidences with Elohim. That's right. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come pass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And how, how, how <laughs> do we remain upright in heart? What do we do? We do what Paul told us to do. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Amen and Maranatha. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, I hope and pray that what I have put forth here makes sense to you. It is truly what I've placed on my heart to share, and I certainly hope that I have honored the request of our dear sister who asked to be comforted by the Word of God. I'd like to say one more thing before we close. <laughs> Earlier in the video, it was pointed out that the Apostle Paul did, without equivocation, instruct us to keep our minds not on things of the earth. He did not instruct us to focus on wars and rumors of wars or earthquakes or famines or plagues or tidal waves. But he did say this, and it truly is all-inclusive regarding what we are to do and be aware of as we close in on Daniel's 70th week. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the Ayatollah and Putin and Pelosi. No, it doesn't say that. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's, that's, what, that's what he told us. Let's remember that there is a reason that the Apostle Paul told us that we did not have to focus on wars and earthquakes and famines and, and most of the things that Jesus spoke of in the Olivet Discourse. And that reason is that we, as the body of Jesus, will be removed before any of these things take place. And knowing that truly brings comfort that surpasseth all understanding. In closing, I have to share with you another comment. Well, it actually came to me uh, in an email. I received it on the 20th of May, and it was this. Are you okay? I watch all your videos. The last one left me a bit worried because you sound very sad. Are you okay? Please send an answer via YouTube to all your followers so we can be sure you are okay. Thank you so much. Good night. It's from AD. Oh dear AD. AD. I'm all right. I'm okay. It's just, it has been a struggle here. Things that I thought were going to happen, well, Abba sees otherwise or has seen otherwise up to this point. 
I, uh, I have never been this close to, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what to say. All I know is that I want to practice what I preach. I want to be able to successfully take no thought for the morrow. <laughs> oh, but we, we do still have these flesh bodies. And we still do struggle with, with finances and with, with relationships or, or a lack thereof. <laughs> In my case, I still have yet to really make a, a good friend here. In Nashville. Um, I'm not blaming Nashville. It's just that it's really kind of hard for me to get around. <laughs> Pray that that uh, Abba steps in soon. I have work that that I do believe will will sustain me at least for a, a bit. The The problem is my being able to get there it's the <laughs> it's the transportation end of the equation here my brothers and sisters uh too far for a bike um <laughs> i had a dear sister oh dear beth uh offer to uh get me a bike but uh it's it's too far for that and and the traffic here is absolutely horrendous it's a, a, a crazy the traffic here but that's really, you know, that's what's going on. I just, uh, I want to trust. Oh, I, I do trust. I trust our Abba. He, is, he has blessed me with so many miracles. I think of Gideon. I think of Gideon so much when I get into situations where things are really coming down to the wire. When uh, Abba told him, you have too much, Gideon. You have too much. You have to scale back. Well, I kind of, <laughs> kind of feel a little bit like Gideon right now, but we know he won. He defeated those Midianites. <laughs> those who know the story know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's the chapter and verse. If you're not familiar with the story of Gideon, it's pretty amazing. Book of Judges, strangest, weirdest book in all of scripture, makes the Game of Thrones look like, you know, an episode of Barney the Dinosaur. Hey, but uh, that's pretty much it. That's what's going on. I'm hanging on. It's not that he wants us to be hanging by a thread. Uh, Pastor JD always talks about that, hanging by a thread. <laughs> but sometimes we are tested. We are tested to see how much we trust him. If we're willing to... Take no thought for a day that doesn't exist. How can you think on Tuesday about Wednesday when there is, there is no guarantee of a Wednesday? <laughs> oh, well, this one, you know, I'm, I'm actually speaking right now on a Wednesday. So this, this one did come. <laughs> oh, my brothers and sisters, I love you so much. And I thank you so much for caring and wondering about my circumstances. You are always there for me. You are always there for me. And I, I ask our Abba Father to protect all of you. Oh, <laughs> to protect all of you in every way, to give you great blessings. And I know that he has done so and will do so because of the times that you have, have so greatly blessed me. Oh, how you have. I could never say it enough. Oh, how I cannot wait to meet you all, to meet you all in the air, where we will be together with our Lord forever and ever. But until then, we occupy. We occupy. And we should definitely take the advice of Paul and teach and admonish and comfort one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Amen and Maranatha.